The emergency services are not immune from the budget cuts that are affecting the public sector and the latest news is that the Isle of Man Fire and Rescue Service must make some savings. I'm with the Chief Fire Officer, um, Kevin Groom. <clears throat> How are you going to achieve the savings that you now need to make? Yes, we issued a, a press release yesterday highlighting areas where following a period of review of all of our services, we've had to make some really, really difficult decisions about the fire and rescue service as it is here now today and where it's going to be in the future. As everyone on the island is, is very much aware, the Isle of Man government has been faced with a budget rebalancing problem. That's something that everyone knows about and everyone talks about on a very regular basis. We're very much signed up to assisting in the budget rebalancing process and we've been working with the department for the last five years. Currently I sit here with, over the next three years, we're actually in year two as I sit here today, with a further 7.5% savings that the Alaman Fire and Rescue Service has to find. And it's really vital that I make the point these are revenue budget savings because there are conversations within the community about the differences between what is revenue budget, which is our day-to-day -day spending, and indeed on a slightly different point, what are capital budgets. So I just want to make sure that we're happy about what is our revenue budget. Fundamentally, it has been reducing over a number of years. We've reached a point now where we've had to make some really difficult decisions, which ultimately will affect the community. Now, I mean, obviously we're talking about the emergency services here and there comes a point where you have cut after cut and it begins to affect public safety, doesn't it? What I've had to do is with my management team and working with the department, we've had to prioritise what are our core services and our core functions. That is, what do we actually have to go out and need to do and rather what is a nice to do. That is really, really difficult. Um, I've been working for the service now for over 32 years. I started in 1982. I've been through the really, really good times. I've been through the quite unpleasant times. And now we are really in critical times. I've had to sit down and we've had to look at everything we do. And we will continue to do that. You know, it doesn't stop at this point. This is just a part of what we're doing now but we're going to have to continue review everything that we do. Now, there will be job losses, and you've talked about voluntary retirements and <clears throat> what we call natural wastage. Um, how many losses will there be? Right. Um, I think we're talking perhaps in the future um, in terms of the tense of, of wording. We have currently um, not replaced two managerial roles within the Fire and Rescue Service. That's whole-time managerial roles and we have also not replaced three retained duty system personnel in the service. With the non-replacement of posts, these posts there is always going to be in effect. Every person who works for the fire and rescue service is an operational officer, that includes myself. So for example, in November 2013, when the huge fire came up at the Mount Murray Hotel, it was really a case of clear the decks and we had to put our resources to deal with that fire, which I believe we dealt with very, very effectively, and that was well reported within the press. Whilst we're dealing with that fire, we also have to maintain a strategic level of fire cover across the Isle of Man, and that was provided at that time by our retained firefighters, either coming to Douglas Station to provide cover or, as well, providing cover across the rest of the island. I have to be really, really careful here that when the resource element, which is our people, are continually being reduced in their numbers, there comes a point where we will be able to unoperate or operate effectively. So by doing these changes, announcing these changes, by prioritizing our core functions, what I'm trying to do, to the best of my ability, is to protect that frontline response. I think as well it's really important to mention at this time um, is about the resilience, uh, which I touch upon by using that Mount Mori Hotel fire example. We also have to look very closely at what's happening nationally, that is across the water. 
Firefighters in the UK at the moment are in the midst of eight days of what we call discontinuous strike action. Therefore, that assistance arrangement I have with the neighbouring fire and rescue services is continually under threat. So if I had a major fire here, right here, right now today, and I wanted to call upon the neighbouring fire and rescue service for assistance arrangements, they're most likely now to turn around and say, very sorry Kevin, we'd love to help you, but I have to prioritise prioritize my delivery service, for example in Merseyside or in Manchester. So I've got to be very, very conscious upon what's happening both locally in terms of maintaining that core functions of our delivery service, but also what's happening across the water as well. It's really, really important. Mm. Now, now, we've just recently had the police announce 11% job cuts and police stations in the Isle of Man are being closed. Yes. Will we lose any fire stations? I am doing the utmost I can to avoid the closing of any fire stations across the Isle of Man. We have six retained fire stations and I believe they provide an absolutely marvellous service to the community of the island. They do that through operational response and they also do it at times on a voluntary basis and uh, they do community safety work. They go into the schools, they hold co coffee mornings and they provide a wonderful service to their local community. I also then look at Douglas Fire Station and I look at what they do. Our whole time firefighters again are absolutely marvellous, professional and dedicated people. The perception perhaps is they're all sat around waiting for a fire call to come in. That couldn't be any further from the truth. They do, obviously they have to train, they have to prepare, they have to maintain equipment. We do a lot of in-house servicing of equipment, breathing apparatus, cylinders, gas tight suits, all our specialist equipment. And it, that brings it all together. So when the call comes in, we are correctly trained and prepared and ready to respond. And that's something that I'm very, very proud of. I'm really proud of the people that work for me. But we are in really, really difficult times. And I believe the public should know quite rightly, this is what we can do now due to the uh, budgetary restraints that are upon us. And we have reviewed it, and we will continue to review what we do. But there's a clear message going out here that I can no longer sustain that delivery of service. And, and as you say, if, should we have another Mount Murray, for example, mm -hmm you're focusing on those core services so that you can meet that need. What services will go, what's going to disappear? Yes, uh, within the um, announcements made yesterday, um, we have unfortunately been able to uh, not be able to continue with our community safety department. That was a team of two um, whole time people who provided a marvellous, a really, really dedicated and marvellous delivery of community safety across the island. We, we were very much involved in partnership working and it, it really does um, concern me that I have now not got the available resource to be able to continue to deliver it in that form. Two or three weeks ago I was um, asked about the Drive Safe Live Long. Uh, that came up as a question in, in Tinwald, uh, an appropriate response was provided and I actually went on to the need to say that that is one element of our community safety work which I would never want to, to stop it happening. It provides a clear message to the youth of the island, gives a great example of working with the Isle of Man Constabulary, the Isle of Man Ambulance and Paramedic Service, and a very good friend of ours who is a Mrs. Sandra Dimler, who unfortunately lost her, her daughter in a very tragic road traffic collision a few years ago. When we look at this delivery of community safety, yes, of course, we've got to think differ differently. How can we deliver it differently? We do some work through our Facebook page and through our Twitter page on a regular basis. We put out very clear messages to the public. We maintain our Test at Tuesday campaign about the weekly tests and the smoke alarms. But right here, right now, we have to focus back upon the core functions. It's really worth mentioning at this time that um, across our retained stations and indeed Douglas Fire Station, people do expend more time on driving the service forward. That is, they'll come in in their own time.
and they'll go out and visit schools, the peace school visits. We hold open events. That comes at complete and, and neutral cost to the public. And I believe it is really important. But it comes back to the point, it's about prioritising a lot of living services. We do have less number of people. Therefore, quite clearly, we are unable to sustain what we do at the moment. Okay, and, and just finally, um, charging for a non-essential 999 course, can you explain what that's about? Yes, I think that there's two uh, elements to um, what you've just said. First and foremost, um, if we look at unwanted automatic fire alarm activations in premises across the island, again for a number of years we've been reviewing about why are we continually getting called to this type of property for that type of occurrence. So for example, we get almost inundated with what we call unwanted calls. That can be, for example, a toaster. Someone puts a toaster in the morning, the toast burns, the fire alarm operates. Workmen can be in a building, they forget to unfail, they forget to inform the emergency services joint control room, and all of a sudden the fire alarm operates because they're using an le electric device, dust is created, and we're on our way. Absolutely no sign of fire, no smell of fire, clear reason for activation, yet we are continually having to mobilise, respond and to that That's what you would charge for then? No, in the I'll come, come on to that, that point about charging if I may, but I, I, I'm really, um, I want to be really clear here about what is an unwanted or nuisance AFA activation because I've observed over the last 24 hours that it's not been correctly reported or indeed understood by the public of the Isle of Man. I've given you some examples of what we call an unwanted or nuisance automatic fire alarm operation. What a building or the, a responsible person a building has got to be aware of is that if we respond to something that is unwanted, then first and foremost that comes at a cost. And I've highlighted the cost of that for the year 13-14. That is £144,000 worth of taxpayers' money. And I think I know there's an expectation that the public would expect me to do something about it. So what we've done is we've reviewed our policy regarding attendance at automatic fire alarms. We've recognised properties that are repeatedly calling us for the examples I've given before. And quite clearly, we have, with working with those premises, we've agreed either a non-attendance, and there's only a very small number of properties who now get a non-attendance, but that's been by agreement, but we've also recognised a reduced attendance as well, and hopefully that will make us more effective and efficient as a fire service. If we're going down the road to an automatic fire alarm activating building, and I've burnt the toast, then all of a sudden a house fire comes in at the same time. That's diverting our resources to what I believe is a genuine call, i.e. the house fire, but we're on, our, we're on the road to the automatic fire alarm. That really doesn't make sense, it certainly doesn't make sense to me. Um, but there's a clear message again in that if a fire alarm operates in a building and there's a view taken by the management, the responsible person, and that'll be part of their fire plan, their evacuation plan, that they can smell smoke, they can see burning, or indeed there is a fire, then of course we would respond appropriately. And that is a key message I need to put out here. The second point you've raised about uh, charging. Um, we went out to public consultation, that is the Department of Home Affairs, to introduce a new fire and rescue service bill. That's about modernising the fire and rescue service in two key elements. That's our service delivery under the Fire Services Act 1984 and also the Fire Precautions Act 1975. Within that um, draft bill, um, we are proposing that we'll be able to charge for certain services. And again, the public perception is, well, I pay my taxes, therefore I expect a service. But is it right that if someone brings the emergency services joint control room and says, reports they've locked themselves out of their car, that a crew of firefighters turns, responds, and lets them into their car, that comes at a cost. 
software because they actually phone a garage or look at a different way of dealing with that issue. Someone arrives People at... People actually do that? So yes, they do. You. I'm giving you some real life People examples People will call here. the fire brigade if yes. they lock themselves out of their yeah, car. Yeah, they do. We um, do get calls to, pe to people locked out of their houses. Now, if there is no risk to an occupant of the house, there's no, I may have left the cooker on or anything like that, then we are getting called to that type of operational incident. And again, that comes at a cost and it diverts our resources away from what we're here to do. More latterly, and it always, the um, example I use, and people say to me, no, that would never happen, the waste pipes just come off the back of my washing machine um, and there's water on my floor. Uh, I want the fire, fire and rescue service to respond to that. That isn't a, an emergency event. That isn't life-threatening. But that's the reality of the type of calls that we respond to. So within the draft bill, there is going to be uh, an opportunity there to, to actually structure a charging policy for that type of circumstances through an operational response. I certainly uh, would invite uh, the public of the Isle of Man to look at uh, the States of Jersey Fire and Rescue Service. They have a very robust charging policy. This isn't new, um, but they are looking at and have looked at other areas of work which they provide to the public of the Isle of Man. And it's something that we'll look at if the progression of the draft bill um, is successful, then hopefully I can present a paper to the department and we can then take it through the, the tunnel process to, to come up with a charging order for the service. We can't do everything that we used to do in the past. I haven't got the resources, I haven't got the people, and indeed the continuing uh, budgetary restrictions have got to be continually reviewed in light of what I can do and what I can't do.